What are you doing? Where are you trying to go? We got it. We got it! We got it! Oh, it's not sub 12, but we got it! No! What? Wait, what? What? Oh! What? Yes! What happens now? What? I. Read the description. Solid run, however, new route is in the work, which involves fighting no bosses. Yeah, that's right. Speedrunners are at it again, destroying another classic from your childhood, Elden Ring. Wait, this game came out two months ago? Why do the graphics look like a PS1 game? And the speedrun is only 7 minutes long? Imagine spending $60 on a 7 minute game. For a fraction of that cost, you can instead get 10 copies of iCarly 2, and that speedrun is 5 hours. It's like 97% more content. I mean sure, I guess this game is supposed to take people nearly 100 hours to beat on average, but in today's video, I'm only worried about the any% percent unrestricted speedrun, which has had an absolute blowout in terms of new strategies in the past couple of weeks, and I think it's finally safe to make a video covering the route, because honestly, we're sort of running out of time to save. So without further ado, today I'll be attempting to answer if speedrunners can not only beat Elden Ring in 10 minutes, but under ideal conditions, could they even beat it in only 5? In this game we start as a Tarnish. An exile from the lands between, tasked with reaching the giant Erd Tree, which holds the remains of the Elden Ring. Along the way, we're meant to beat a series of bosses, which eventually results in the burning of the Erd Tree, to finally be able to enter it and face the challenges that lay within. There are several alternate endings to Elden Ring, but today we'll be focusing on the default one to repair the Elden Ring and become Elden Lord. So to explain the route, let's first start with the restricted any% percent category. In this game, the timing ends whenever the credits begin to roll after touching the fractured Marika. This can only be done after defeating the Radagon and Elden Beast boss fights, which means there are at least two bosses we'll have to fight in this run. In order to reach Radagon in the Ashen Capital, normally we have to defeat Gideon Offner and Godfrey along the way, but we've had skips for these guys for weeks now, and they're not really an issue. The difficult part is actually getting to the Ashen Capital itself. This version of Liandel doesn't exist in the game world until after defeating Malekith the Blackblade. But in order to fight Malekith, we'd first need to get to Furumizula, a crumbling floating area way off in the distance on the world map. So the same issue arises yet again. In order to get to Furumizula, we would need to trigger another world event to unlock this area as well. Or do we? Souls game speedruns are well known for making use of wrong warp glitches, and the fact that they also occur in Elden Ring is no real surprise. The basic idea of a wrong warp is to initiate a warp to a location, but manipulate the game into sending you to a different unintended location instead. The Elden Ring map is separated in several different chunks, and each chunk of the map has a predetermined default spawn location in the event the game has no idea where to place your character. So the idea of wrong warps is to abuse these default spawn locations to skip into later sections. This map created by Time Walk shows all of the different chunks, and has each chunk marked to show what the result is from wrong warping in each section. Some spawn locations place you inbounds, usually at the start of a dungeon, or a random spot on the map but others will either place you out of bounds on stable ground, or will just spawn you out of bounds falling to your death. In Elden Ring, there are about 5 different ways to initiate wrong warps, most of which have already been covered by Carl Jops in his Elden Ring video, so if you'd like to learn more about wrong warps specifically, I'd recommend checking that out. But there's one method that he didn't cover, which is the simplest of them all, and that is a force quit wrong warp. This version of wrong warping is only allowed in the any% percent unrestricted category, since the community was split on whether to allow them because it literally requires alt f 4 out of your game to pull off. How it works is you first need to stand in the region you want to wrong warp within. Warp to a different location on the map, and then at any point during the loading screen, press alt f 4 to close out of the game. When you do this, the game doesn't close immediately, and instead it waits until the load finishes, and then instantly quits out afterwards. This quit out is so quick, your character never even gets a chance to load in. Because of this, the game never updates your stable ground location, and resorts to sending you to the default spawn location of the last place you were standing in. If we go to a location called the Four Belfries, we can open a chest at the top for a magic imbue key to unlock any of the portals at each belfry. These portals allow you to preview other areas of the game, like Nocron, and also revisit the Champ of Anticipation to rematch the tutorial boss. 
But the portal we're interested in is the bottom belfry, which sends us to a sub area for Missoula, separate from the main region. I think the point of this sub area is to show off the insane landscape as a preview to the player of what's to come later in the game. But of course, if you could see where I was going with this, when speedrunners wrong warp while in the sub area, they're loading at the default spawn location at the start of the main area. This means if we factor in wrong warps, the minimum requirements for a speedrun would be able to go from the start of the game to the four belfries, and from the four belfries go straight to Fura Missoula. On the way to Malekith, speedrunners will also have to fight the Godskin duo, which means the minimum requirements for the restricted any% percent route is 4 bosses. The problem is, how are we going to beat 4 of the most difficult late game bosses with only the levels and gear we acquired from character creation? Well, we're not. In the any% percent restricted category, finding new weapons and upgrading them saves so much time it's mandatory for the late game fights. The weapon we choose depends on which patch we're playing on. On any version before patch 1.03, the Icewind Hatchet is without a doubt the best option for any% percent speedruns. The Icewind Hatchet is a special weapon that comes with the Ash of War Horfrost Stomp, which is probably in the top 5 most powerful Ashes of War. It hits from a mid-range distance, doing solid damage, and inflicts frost buildup which eventually procs over time and deals damage similar to bleed depending on the opponent's max HP. But what makes this weapon best for the run is that we can pick it up almost directly on the way to the 4 Belfries. The Ice Run is also a special weapon, which means it can only be leveled up with Somber Smithing Stones. This is important because weapons that are upgraded with Somber Stones are way easier to upgrade than normal weapons. For special weapons, you only need one Somber Stone for each upgrade, and the upgrade maxes out at plus 10. This is significantly less than normal weapons, which require 12 of each tier Smithing Stone to max out at plus 25. Not only this, but in earlier patches, Ashes of War like Royal Knight's Resolve and Determination are completely bugged. Royal Knight's Resolve, for example, is meant to buff your next landed attack by 80% as long as you land the attack within 10 seconds. And then after an attack is successfully landed, the buff goes away. This buff is only meant to work with the weapon RKR is attached to, nothing else. But people found out that if they activated RKR two-handed and then switched to dual wielding a different weapon in the main hand, the buff would still be applied to the main weapon's attacks since the RKR weapon was technically still equipped. And even if we successfully landed an attack with the main hand weapon, the buff wouldn't go away meaning we could get buffed attacks for the full 10 seconds. Surprisingly, this isn't even the only way this Ash of War is bugged. If RKR was attached to a weapon we didn't have the stats for, the effect would still activate, but no FP would be consumed. With this combo of the Ice Rent Hatchet and Royal Knight's Resolve, we'd be able to dish out serious damage with relatively low FP consumption. Anyways, in short, the any% percent route starts the game and goes straight to the Gatefront Grace to unlock the Horse Torrent. We then beeline to the four belfries, using intended portals to get there quicker, and pick up the Ice Run Hatchet and Raya Academy Key along the way. From the belfries we wrong warp to Fru Missoula early, to pick up some golden runes, to afford some early upgrades, and pick up Somber Stones 8 and 9, just so we have them on us when we're ready to fully upgrade the hatchet later. We grab the Dragon Temple Grace just before the gods can do a boss fight, so we can come back to it quickly later. The rest of the speedrun, up till we return to the Godskin duo boss fight, is just a collectathon to upgrade our weapons for max damage. We first start by using a wrong warp to the Four Belfry's Grace, which puts us close to the King's Realm Ruins, to shop and upgrade the Ice Run Hatchet to plus 4 at Warmaster EG. We then head to the Academy, doing some horse flying shenanigans to get to the bottom of a lift quickly, and then get grabbed by an abductor statue for an intended warp to Volcano Manor. While in the manor, we'll collect Somber Stones 5 through 7 and Royal Knight's Resolve, and also use an AI break to kill the Godskin Noble to give us an offhand weapon and the remainder runes needed for the plus 9 Ice Friend, as well as a couple of additional mind levels for more FP. The rest of the run is a boss rush to kill Godskin Duo, Malekith, Radagon, and then for the last fight versus Elden Beast, if we summon some imps and stand at the side of the beast, as long as we do enough damage, it's possible to break the AI and kill the boss without it ever attacking us. All of this results in a roughly 25 minute speed run, assuming everything is done optimally. So if 25 minutes is the limit for the restricted category, what exactly is going on in unrestricted that makes it so much faster, and furthermore, why are the categories separated in the first place? Well, let me tell you all about zips. A zip is a very strange bug unique to Elden Ring that allows speedrunners to build up an insane amount of speed to teleport around the game. In short, these are performed by blocking and walking forward. Of course, if it were that simple, this probably would have been found in testing, but this trick requires a frame perfect walk forward to execute, making it pretty difficult to time. Basically, the walk input needs to be timed right when the idle block animation loops, and for some reason this causes zips to happen, but we really have no idea why. 
The reason why this trick is banned in all other speedrunning categories other than any percent unrestricted is because it's somewhat hardware based. For some reason it works more consistently for some people than others, but in general it should work for most people assuming they have consistent PC performance, maintaining a stable 60 frames per second. Any other frame rate will either throw off the timing by a few frames or cause the trick to not work at all. As for how to control zips and make them useful for speedruns, it all depends on where we aim. Zips will always shoot straight forward, but depending on what kind of geometry is in front of the player determines where they end up. For instance, zipping up a slope will cause the player to shoot way up in the air, and because of how the game calculates fall damage, we can survive most zips as long as the spot we land on is higher than the location we started the zip from. There are also reverse zips we can do into walls, which will bounce us in the opposite direction, building up more speed than the typical zip. And then if we combine uphill zips and reverse zips together, we can fly high in the air at insane speeds, going just about anywhere we need to. Once zips were finally made consistent enough to perform in runs, and were also allowed in the leaderboards, speedrunners quickly started implementing them into runs. The first major application was a skip for the Godskin duo that would skip the entire boss fight and also the entire trek through the area up till Malekith. If performed quickly, it could save up to 4 minutes over the restricted route, but applications of zips didn't stop there. As speedrunners continued to get more consistent with zips by using metronomes, upgrading software, and lowering game settings, more and more zips got added into the run. It got to the point where any section of the run with a significant amount of running would get a zip added to it. For example, just zipping to the Gatefront Grace and then zipping to the Purified Ruins saved nearly two and a half minutes on its own. And then there was one added to zip to the Fort Belfries, one in Firm Missoula, a few in Volcano Manor, and so on. Zips were turning into a strat you could do anywhere that would almost always save time assuming you got it within enough attempts. With all these new zips added into the run, the route became about 8 or 9 minutes faster than the restricted run. At this point we were running out of theoretical time saves and were looking for new routes to collect somber stones 5 and 6 rather than running through Volcano Manor, which is normally about a 5 minute detour. But then out of nowhere, two major discoveries were found nearly at the same time that would make weapon upgrades unnecessary for the run. The first trick was the method of killing Elden Beast without needing to fight it. By using Cheat Engine to clip through the map, it was discovered that Elden Beast didn't get loaded in after the fight with Radagon, but it was actually loaded in the entire time underneath the platform. By further abusing no clip tools, or using the Pegasus glitch to ride Torrent out of bounds, if we ran far away enough from the map, Elden Beast would mysteriously die, and we'd be rewarded its remembrance, which apparently is the only thing needed to trigger the cutscene, to place us next to the fractured Marika. This works because by running so far away from the map, the area behind us gets deloaded, leaving Elden Beast with no platform to stand on, so it begins falling into the void. In an Elden Ring, if a player NPC is suspended in air for 13 seconds, the game automatically kills them to prevent softlocks. So while this was an amazing discovery, in reality, it wasn't going to save much time. Because in a theoretical speedrun, we would have to make our way to the castle rampart to get on torrent, set up the Pegasus glitch, fly close to the Radagon fight to spawn in the Elden Beast, and then run out of bounds until Elden Beast despawned, which took about 5 minutes. The benefit is that we would get to skip upgrading weapons, but like I said earlier, the detour for upgrading weapons was already 5 minutes. Also if we skipped upgrades, Malekith would be need to fought with a plus 4 ice run hatchet, making the fight much more dangerous. This route did save a bit more time over the world record at the time, but only just barely, and it definitely didn't have any potential in getting sub 15, while the other route did, so the idea was put on the shelf for another day. But as it turns out, that day would come sooner than later, as another major discovery was made, called Mega Zips. Mega Zips are a more powerful version of regular Zips, they can get over 4 times the distance, allowing speedrunners to launch themselves insanely far across the map. These work almost exactly the same as regular Zips, but require an additional directional press at least 14 frames after the first one, with larger Mega Zips occurring closer to the end of the 14 frame window. With this new discovery in mind, the Elden Beast Insta Kill became a reality for speedruns as we would no longer need to use a Pegasus glitch and could instead use Mega Zips to clear the distance needed for the despawn in a fraction of the time. Speedrunners instantly began using this in runs, improving the speedrun to about 12 minutes. I found speedruns using this route to be exciting to watch because even though they were skipping Radagon and Elden Beast, Malekith had to be fought with a plus 4 Ice Run Hatchet with no other buffs. Because Horfrost Stomp wasn't doing a lot of damage on its own, Speedrunners were allowed on using Frostbite procs to do most of the damage. For this reason, the Samurai was chosen for speedruns to use Fire Arrows, which would reset the Frost buildup after the Frostbite proc occurred. This was stressful for speedrunners, because after having to do a series of different zips to get to the point of fighting Malekith, they would have to do this absurd boss fight, and then do a difficult Mega Zip immediately afterwards. Things were only going to get more difficult from here. 
Eventually, a setup was discovered to be able to use Mega Zips on Malekith to despawn him in a similar way, like the Elden Beast, but doing this with Malekith was much more complicated. In order to use a Mega Zip to despawn Malekith, his fight would first need to be activated. This is because if we did the Mega Zip without activating the fight, it would kill the Phase 1 Beast clergyman, but Phase 2 wouldn't spawn incorrectly, with no way of finishing the fight. So the issue became that if we wanted to use Mega Zips, we would have to enter the arena first. Malekith is fought in an arena, on a flat surface, surrounded by a bunch of pillars. Speedrunners would need to find a zip setup to get themselves out of the arena, and then make a zip away from it, all while Malekith is chasing them down with the ability to kill them in one hit. Even after successfully hitting the mega zip to despawn Beast Clergyman, they would then have to do the same thing all over again, this time with Phase 2 Malekith chasing after them instead. But assuming they would be able to pull this all off, this means that speedruns would be able to beat Malekith without fighting him, meaning the list of requirements for finishing a run just got significantly smaller. Let's look over this any% percent unrestricted speedrun by Distortion 2 to see exactly what all could be skipped with these new mega zips. Normally in speedruns, we would need to die to the tutorial boss to unlock flasks. But since we weren't fighting bosses anymore, flasks aren't needed. Instead, right from the Chapel of Anticipation, Distortion does a reverse zip to go straight to the Stormveil Castle that we can see in the background. The setup used here is very specific to land him next to the castle exit, leading to Liurnia. From here he'll do another zip to get to the academy, and a zip from the academy to the four belfries. This setup is used since there hasn't been a consistent zip found yet to go from the castle exit to the four belfries, and the one from the academy places him pretty close to the chest for the key to cut out running since we never unlocked the horse. From here he runs to the bottom belfry portal to get sent to Fur Missoula. At this point he hasn't unlocked any sites of grace, so the respawn location is still set to the Chapel of Anticipation. This is actually perfect, because by activating the memory of grace, the game will take him back to the chapel, and he can use this load screen to force quit out of the game, causing a wrong warp. From here he'll make his way through Fermazula, using the occasional zip to save time, and quitting out to avoid enemies, until he reaches a spot for a zip setup to Malekith. I guess I forgot to mention that speedruns for this game make use of a live split plugin that uses modified in-game time to ensure a level playing field for everyone. A byproduct of using a timing method like this means that quitting out of the game to skip animations and avoid enemies becomes a legitimate strategy to save time. While I'm not the biggest fan of strategies like this myself, having a timer like this is important for fairness. But also in a category like this that involves force quitting out of the game, speedruns would come down to who can boot up their game the quickest, which is not only out of the player's control, but at times is entirely random. Anyways, while I was explaining all of this, you can see Distortion doing a setups for despawning Malekith in the background. What's funny here is after despawning the Beast Clergyman, you can see he gets a full Malformed Dragon armor set from the Draconic Tree Sentinel that also gets despawned as a helpless bystander. Following Malekith's second phase getting killed, he quits out of the game after getting his remembrance, and we're now onto the final section of the run. After entering the Ashen Capital, Distortion does an uphill zip to the Erd Tree to spawn in the Elden Beast, and then does a Mega Zip to shoot him far away to despawn it. Some other aspects I have yet to mention about Mega Zips and the despawn strat is that Distortion picks the Vagabond class because it's easy to get a heavy equipment load with it, which for some reason allows for slightly further zips. At the end of the Mega Zip, after falling for a short period, Distortion initiates a plunge attack, which for some reason resets the 13 second fall timer. This is why he always manages to die after the bosses, rather than before them, even though he's falling for a longer period of time. After doing the Mega Zip in the Ashen Capital, Godfrey will die first, activating his cutscene, and fight against Hor Lu. And then the Elden Beast will die shortly after. Distortion allows himself to get grab attacked by Horlu, which causes him to die and forces a loading screen. But since Elden Beast died, the game just loads him into where he should be after killing it, next to the Fractured Marika, and it's game over, finishing the run in 6 minutes and 59 seconds. A pretty ridiculous run, but only a few days ago was beaten again and dropped to a 6 minute and 46 second time by Seeker TV using a couple of new strats. But the question still remains, can it be done in 5 minutes? To answer this question, I'm going to be using a combination of segments put together from Seeker 646 and best segments listed on his live split timer, and also an NG Plus tool assisted run made by Derive, which beats the game in 3 minutes and 30 seconds. It's worth stating that the main reason this run is so much faster is since NG Plus still has access to weapons in the horse, which saves off a little time running to the bottom belfry, but saves a lot by two-shotting Malekith rather than despawning him, so I won't be including those segments. The task uses a zip setup to get to the academy from a different spot that goes straight to the second zip spot, saving around 15 to 20 seconds. This zip is a lot more frame tight, but since it's done at the beginning of the run, we may potentially see it get added in eventually. 
Of course, it would theoretically be faster for us just to make a zip straight to the four belfries from the Chapel of Anticipation, but the problem is that if we do so, Lyurnia doesn't load in correctly, which is why we have to zip to Stormfield Castle first and exit it. Maybe in the future we'll find a different way to load in Lyurnia, or just find a faster zip out of Stormfield Castle to go straight to the four belfries chests. I don't believe there will be any way to save time running from the chest to the bottom belfry portal, because even if we were able to zip to it, we'd just die from fall damage anyways. The next comparison can be made right after the wrong warp up till skipping Malekith. The task uses a zip at the start of Furumazula that most likely won't be viable for any percent runs since it requires taking fall damage, which we already have to do for getting to Malekith. But let's just assume it's viable for now. Assuming the zip is included, as well as first try zips in Malekith, this segment takes the task 48 seconds compared to Seeker's run, which takes a minute and 20 seconds, meaning around 30 seconds could be theoretically saved here with perfect execution. In Seeker's world record run, he managed to get a gold segment on Malekith, and since Malekith skip already takes precise execution time-wise, let's just assume there isn't any additional time to save here, and move on to the last segment. Seeker actually ended up losing a lot of time in the final split, taking him 2 minutes and 3 seconds to perform, compared to his best segment of 1 minute and 11 seconds. However, the task uses a different setup, which cuts out a lot of running by starting the zip from the right side, which instantly places the character on a small platform out of bounds. This saves a bit of time compared to running to the other setup, it cuts out the fall time, and it cuts out needing to run up the stairs. You would think this would save more time than what it does, but this makes this segment 56 seconds long, only 15 seconds faster than Seeker's gold split. But if we add up all of the time saves from these three segments in the task, which are all theoretically doable, albeit probably too difficult and not worth, speedrunners could save about a minute and 20 seconds, with most of the potential time save being from faster zips to the four belfries and a much cleaner for a Missoula route. If we apply this time save to Seeker's sum of best segments, even if we include a little leeway, sub 5 is definitely possible, but unlikely without new strategies. A sub 6 minute run on its own would be extremely impressive, so we'll need to see that achieved first before we can even talk about sub 5. Hey guys, I'm recording this while editing, but Seeker did manage to finally get the sub 6 minute run with a 558. I didn't feel the need to update the script since his sum of best didn't update at all, meaning he got this run within 15 seconds of his best segments. So everything in this video is still accurate, but if you want to check out that run, I'll have it linked below. Anyways guys, I hope you enjoyed this video and at least found it informative. While I'm not sure if this is what people expected to see from Elden Ring speedrunning when the game came out, and the novelty of any percent already seems to be wearing off to most people, I still think it's a really interesting category. Weeks and weeks of glitch and strat hunting, and speedrunning's mastering frame perfect techniques to break the game in this fashion is really what speedrunning is all about, and should at least be appreciated for the hard work that goes into it. If you guys are looking to learn even more about Elden Ring speedrunning, I've left quite a few links to videos and write-ups that go more into detail about some of the glitches used in the speedrun, as well as the Speed Souls Discord server. Anyways guys, that's all I have to say for today's video. Be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more speedrunning related content. And as always, I hope you all have a beautiful life.